It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Cinemassacre. To close out this year's Monster Madness, I'd say I left the best for last. We've had mummies, Frankenstein, giant monsters, aliens. It's only fitting that we end with zombies. And there's no zombie series more important than director George Romero's Dead series. You know the gist. It's set in a dystopian, end-of-the-world type environment. The dead rise to eat the flesh the living. They can only be killed by having their brains destroyed with a bullet or other object. The living people struggle for survival and fight amongst themselves. That's the formula that all zombie movies follow followed since. Of course, in the past decade, there's been so many zombie movies, it's mind-numbing. Recently, The Walking Dead show brought it to the mainstream with television audiences. Zombies have probably never been more popular than they are now, but they still seem to take their inspiration from the George Romero films. We all know the first one, but if you didn't, it was Night of the Living Dead in 1968, the only black and white film of the franchise. I talked about it during the first year's Monster Madness, and in my top 30 favorite films list, and in my trip to the Night Living Dead Cemetery video, so I think I've already said enough about it. But you know what? This is Sequel-a-thon, so I can't skip over the movie that single-handedly changed the face of the whole horror movie industry, so I'm going to save it for Halloween. Maybe a little unconventional that we're going out of order, but I have something special planned for it. Anyway, Dawn of the Dead I also mentioned the first year, but let's dig deeper. It was released in 1978, ten years after the original. With no survivors from the previous film, at least not from the main cast, this one started fresh and new. One thing that has to be said about the Dead series is that even though they're considered to be sequels, they typically don't have any recurring characters. But each movie seems to have a progression that the zombie apocalypse is growing and the human population is becoming less and less. As the movie begins, all-out madness is going on. A TV news station is swamped with stories of the zombie epidemic. Also, a SWAT team is busting in on a building only to be attacked by the living dead. It's brutal. Flesh is bitten off and a head is blown to pieces. The movie gives you no time to brace yourself. It drops you straight into the pandemonium. Two SWAT members escape into a helicopter along with two news reporters. They need fuel so they land at a gas station where more zombie attacks happen. Another creative gory highlight happens when the blades of the helicopter chop off the top of a zombie's head. Another thing that happens here is a group of child zombies have to be gunned down. This is one of the most disturbing scenes. Actor Ken Forey has said that this was a very difficult scene to shoot because it was so horrible, but that's the thing about these movies is that it's very grim and unapologetic. If this were to happen in real life, if there really was a zombie epidemic, same thing would happen to children too. Also in this scene, we're shown how useless the female character is. What is she doing? She's not helping at all. She's just standing there. The women in these movies are always flat, badly ridden characters. The SWAT team scene and the gas station scene are just warm-ups to the main event. And that's the shopping mall. Hiding in a mall seems like the prime choice of a place to hide out if there's a zombie apocalypse. They have plenty of resources in there. Food, clothes, anything they need. Even a gun shop. People often complain about characters in horror movies doing things that are stupid, but these characters are smart and that makes us respect them. As the movie goes on, we come to know them like old friends and we root for their survival. It isn't that easy. First they need to lure many of the zombies out of the mall and lock them out. There's a lot of strategy involved and it takes a lot of the film's running time. Something that would seem tedious, but it's done so convincingly that it never comes off as boring. You can imagine yourself in this situation and thinking about what you would do. It's also fun to imagine what it would be like to have an entire shopping mall to yourself. The characters do manage to get some much deserved downtime. They just go all around the mall and do whatever they want. While most of the film is dark and serious in tone, this part offers some comedic relief. Relief is the key word here. We breathe a sigh and laugh along with these characters as if we are in the mall with them. You get a genuinely triumphant feeling when you see them celebrating with one another. 
Earlier on, they were arguing and pointing guns at each other, and now, after all their teamwork and strategy, they've become buddies. In Night of the Living Dead, the survivors try to work together, but end up fighting. Dawn of the Dead is the dawn, the light at the end of the tunnel. It's a more optimistic look at people. Through hard work and teamwork, we can all settle our differences. The mall setting gives a great opportunity for lots of comedy, but it's also noted that it's social satire as well, comparing mall shoppers to zombies. I can't imagine what it was like filming inside the mall, and yes, it was a real shopping mall. On the documentary on the DVD, they say that they'd film each night when the mall was closed. And I find that really hard to imagine. How could they clean up everything by the morning? Like somewhere there must have been a blood stain or some guts laying around for a mall shopper to find. The mall is located in Monroeville, Pennsylvania. We at Cinemassacre took a trip there one time, and it's barely recognizable from the film. Unless you have some screen grabs to take with you, it's not easy to remember anything from the film. The giant clock is gone, and there's no indication that this innocent mall was at one time the scene of one of the biggest bloodbaths in horror history. The master of gore, Tom Savini, does the special effects, but also plays one of the film's most memorable characters, the machete-wielding leader of a motorcycle gang. Once again, the movie handles the situation realistically. If there was a perfect place to hide out in a zombie epidemic, our main protagonists would not be the only people who want to hide there. This hard-partying, rebellious motorcycle gang doesn't want to share. They want to bust in and take the place for their own. The final act of the film is just all-out chaos. Tops the original with gore. Heads are cut off, intestines are ripped out. Man, it's crazy. The music is also very memorable. It's done by a band called Goblin. One of my favorite parts is when one of the motorcycle guys checks his blood pressure on one of those mall things. Oh man, what the hell are you doing playing around? Someone's up there shooting. He's so casual, he should be yelling, up there! But no, instead, what the hell are you doing playing around when someone's up there shooting at us? There's lots of parts where the humor grows on me. The guy with the mustache cracks me up. He must get in through the roof. Son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. I got trucks blocking all the entrances, look at that. Yeah, trucks. Yeah, trucks. Also, love when Flyboy becomes a zombie. This is probably my favorite zombie of all time. I like all the little details, like the gun dangling from his hand. The character was holding the gun before he died, so the zombie isn't intentionally holding the gun. The gun just happens to be there. And that walk he does, it looks like he really is mangled up. Overall, Dawn of the Dead is simply a masterpiece sequel. It's one of those rare Bride of Frankenstein or Aliens type situations where the sequel is debatably better than the first one. Following in the footsteps of a groundbreaking horror masterpiece, this one manages to be groundbreaking all over again in its own right. There's different cuts to this movie. There's the US version, the European version, and the extended version, which runs a little bit too long. Between the US and European versions, they both have their advantages. It's hard to pick one. Dario Argento handled the European version and had his disagreements with George Romero. I think if I had to choose one, I'd pick the US version just because it has some great moments that were missing from the European version. Either way, you're in for a great film. I can't do it justice, so don't listen to me. Just watch it for yourself. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Day of the Dead was the Black Sheep sequel of the franchise. It had two masterpieces to compare with, and it came out in 1985, the same year as Return of the Living Dead, Fright Night, and Reanimator so it had a lot to live up to. George Romero's original script was so large and epic that Tom Savini described it as the Ben-Hur of zombie movies. Unfortunately, there were budget cuts, and the finished film wasn't as huge a scale as Romero intended. When it came out, fans and critics hated it, but over the years since, it's been re-evaluated, and people are starting to realize it overcame the number three curse it's another masterpiece, like the first two. So how did its excellence go unnoticed for so long? Same happened with me. The first time I saw it, I didn't like it. I thought that it paled in comparison to the first two movies. It didn't have a memorable soundtrack. It didn't have a fun mall setting. 
not as many funny one-liners, but over the years after re-watching it, it's grown on me like a fungus. The opening scene shows a city overrun by zombies, with no human life anywhere in sight. It's one of the most creepy, dystopian scenes in the series. It tells you everything you need to know without any dialogue. These images say it all. This is our glimpse of the surface. The rest of the movie, we go below ground level, where the only survivors are in the hands of a military operation run by the ruthless Captain Rhodes, played by Joe Palato. A large part of why this movie is so awesome is because of his performance. This guy is one mean son of a bitch. If someone doesn't follow his orders, he has no hesitation to threaten them with deadly force. Any scene he's in is full of nervous tension. He also has no compassion for the scientists who are working themselves to exhaustion. Is there food? I'm running this monkey for him now, Frankenstein! He's and easily I'm... one of the best villains of the 80s. The guy you love to hate. Then there's the head scientist who's always referred to as Frankenstein. He's a very convincing character, unshaven, glazy eyes, looks like he hasn't slept in ages. He's supposed to be finding the solution to stop the dead from rising, but instead he starts teaching them to be civilized. The zombie, named Bub, shows signs of humanity and comes off as innocent and sympathetic. He is the Frankenstein monster of the film. The people in the film are the ones who are less civilized. The first two dead movies brushed upon this theme, but now we're going under the surface, and while we are quite literally going underground, we are getting at the core of what these movies are really about, the dehumanization of people and the rise of the dead. I think if it were to go full circle, we might have Planet of the Zombies, kind of like Planet of the Apes, where apes are the intelligent life form and people are the animals. The two main soldiers are like Rhodes' two bumbling sidekicks, spending most of the time insulting the zombies like they even care. It's a comedy show. <laughs> well, having funny villains is one thing, but how about protagonists who we root for? Most of the characters are pretty generic, but the one who stands out is Sarah. She's the first woman in a George Romero zombie movie to not be a throwaway character. She takes a lot of shit from the guys, and that makes us root for her. She dares to talk back to Rhodes and tries to be the mediator between everything that's going on. She's tough, not at all a wimp, and if there is a protagonist in the film, it's her. The score is also great, even though it's not catchy like in Dawn of the Dead. It's played at minimum just to accentuate all the tense moments. A lot of the film's running time is long dialogue scenes, but at least the dialogue is riveting. It also dishes out a heavy serving of action and gore. Flesh is chewed, eyeballs get ripped out, fingers get bitten off, and one of my favorites is the shovel kill. When I first saw the movie and didn't like it, I was still impressed by the gore. This has to be Tom Savini's crowning achievement. It's a true testament to the power of practical special effects. It's absolutely brutal. People commit suicide, sacrifice themselves to the zombies, and earlier, when this guy gets bitten on the arm, his friends try to save his life by amputating the arm. Never had that been done before. Usually in these movies, once you get bitten, you're a goner. The people in this movie don't just die, they fucking suffer. Here we have a guy who gets torn apart, and notice that when his vocal cords get ripped out, his voice screeches. It's like you yanked out the tape from an audio cassette player. But the ultimate death, and I mean the most horrible death that ever happens to anyone, is the guy who deserves it, when Rhodes is ripped into shreds. They used real cow guts from a butcher shop, and they kept them in a fridge. But something happened, they lost power, or for some reason the guts got spoiled. So you can imagine what the smell was like. So just as the character is going through hell, so is the actor. Day of the Dead, with its apocalyptic setting and power struggles going on, it very much feels like some of the same themes from the earlier films are being repeated. But this movie took it a step further. It's darker than the other movies, and being underground the whole time, it feels a lot more claustrophobic. We're stuck with a bunch of nutty characters, and it feels like we're in the madhouse with them. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It would have been the perfect way to end the trilogy. 
It's probably the best horror trilogy since the Karloff trilogy of Frankenstein films. I know I equate this to Frankenstein all the time, but it's true. As far as quality goes, the third Dead movie is the equivalent of the third Frankenstein film. It's the one that at first seems inferior, but as time goes on, it grows on you. All three of them have their own advantages, so it's hard to pick a favorite, and each one represents the decade in which it was made. Night of the Living Dead was the 60s, Dawn of the Dead was the 70s, Day of the Dead was the 80s. I think 1985 was the peak year in zombie films. You had Return of the Living Dead and Reanimator and all that. I think after that year, zombie movies were done. Like, that's it. You can't beat it. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Day of the Dead seemed like the definitive end to the Dead series. It tied it all up in a nice, beautiful bow of blood-soaked intestines. Night Living Dead was remade in 1990 with Tom Savini in the director's chair. Once they start remaking the franchise, you know that they're never going to go back and do more sequels. And by the 2000s, zombie movies were in full bloom again. There were more zombie movies in the 2000s than there were in every other decade total, including a remake of both Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead. Rumors of a fourth Dead film were floating around for a long time, but then it finally happened. The master himself, George Romero, made a much welcomed return to the genre that he created. The long-awaited follow-up was released in 2005, a full 20 years since the last film of the franchise. Since we went from night to dawn to day, everyone assumed this would be Dusk of the Dead or Twilight of the Dead, but we were all wrong. It was Land of the Dead. All the other zombie movies of the time stopped and bowed down to the true king. This wasn't just another zombie movie. This was the real thing. It was George Romero. All the other movies seemed like appetizers for the main course. But in the grand scheme of things, Land of the Dead unfortunately seemed to blend in with the rest. In comparison to all the other zombie films that were going on, it comes off as somewhat generic. It's still my favorite zombie film of the decade, but I can see why it was overlooked. I blame it on an oversaturation of the genre. Just as all these movies were paying tribute to the George Romero films, George Romero was still paying little tributes to the classic Universal films. It opens with the old Universal logo from the 30s. In Day of the Dead, our last survivors were living underground, but land brings us back to the surface in a much less claustrophobic landscape, where we can see all the areas where life still goes on in this zombie apocalypse. Now we're at a point where zombies are so commonplace that people are more used to them. The living have integrated the dead into their lives and use them for fun and games. By the way, that's Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright. George Romero was a big fan of Shaun of the Dead, so he invited them over to be in the film. Here we have what I'd call a modern medieval setting where there's a very distinct barrier between the rich and the poor. In the center of it all is a place called Fiddler's Green. This would be the castle where the king in charge is none other than Dennis Hopper. That's right, Dennis over the top fucking Hopper. Seeing him as the villain made it feel like the 90s again. Fiddler's Green is a place of luxury where all the people enjoy themselves and give no thought to the horror that's going on outside. It's very much like the Edgar Allan Poe story, Mask of the Red Death, where the plague is killing everybody on the outside while the prince throws a party inside his safe fortress for all his elite crowd. On the outside, you have the slums where people are living dirt poor. Somewhere in between, you have John Leguizamo, who plays an assassin named Cholo, who works for Dennis Hopper's character, Kaufman. After working for his boss for so long and trying to schmooze him over with some cheap sparkling wine that he robbed from a liquor store, Cholo asks him for his own place in the green. But Kaufman denies him, and that really pisses off Cholo. Hmm... John Leguizamo and Dennis Hopper. I'm having some kind of deja vu moment here. You know what I'm thinking of. The Super Mario Brothers movie. Luigi and Koopa. It's a Super Mario Brothers reunion. Anyway, Luigi, I mean Cholo, gets his hands on a giant killing weapon called Dead Reckoning. Strangely, that was the working title of the film. 
It's like a giant train that shoots missiles. At first, I hated this thing and thought it made the movie feel too much like a comic book. But now, I don't mind it. It's pretty badass. Cholo threatens Kaufman with this thing, demanding a shitload of money, or else he's gonna aim his missiles at Fiddler's Green. I'm gonna blow you out of your fucking castle. He said castle. You mean like Bowser's castle? On the outskirts of the city are a group of zombies led by one known as Big Daddy who's growing in intelligence, and decides to lead them all to Fiddler's Green. Throughout the film, they keep getting closer. We follow their progress as if they're on a great adventure. With Cholo ready to fire missiles at the city and the zombies closing in, the movie reaches its climax and all hell breaks loose. The zombies break in the Fiddler's Green, which by the way is the worst glass break ever. I think the most disappointing part of the film is the gore. Each of the dead movies upped the ante on the gore, so I felt this one should have done the same. And yes, it is very gory, but I think because it's the fourth movie, the kills should have been more creative and over the top. That's just my preference. Even with the uncut version, I didn't notice any difference. I'm sure there's extra frames here and there that the shots go on a little bit longer, but it's nothing noticeable. It's just as disappointing as the uncut version of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Also, a lot of the blood is computer generated. It looks like a Resident Evil video game. I miss the bright red hyper-realistic blood from Dawn of the Dead. There are some great highlights, but they're brief. My favorite is the grenade kill. This time, the effects are not done by Tom Savini, but instead Greg Nicoretto, who worked under Tom Savini on Day of the Dead, so it's the perfect transition. And in between that time, he worked on a lot of horror films, like Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, and From Dusk Till Dawn. Tom Savini does a cameo. Ever since I saw it, I wondered, is this the same character he played in Dawn of the Dead, now as a zombie? I'm, I'm carrying a machete! Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, what are you gonna do, stuff it down your throat? You know, I mean, right there, look. Imagine that as a zombie, and you got Land of the Dead. So basically, duh, it is. It's the first recurring character in a Romero zombie movie. This is much darker than the earlier films, and I mean that literally. It's dark and atmospheric with many excellent shots. Many of them are green screened with lots of separate elements and layers completing the picture, but it's done so well you don't notice. It looks awesome. The image of the zombies coming out of the water is unforgettable, obviously inspired by Carnival of Souls. So I've mentioned its strengths and its weaknesses. Overall, Land of the Dead doesn't match its predecessors, but it's still pretty damn good. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. I have to say, I was one of those who was eagerly awaiting Land of the Dead. It was the first George Romero zombie movie in 20 years. I was satisfied with it, I got my fix. But then, only two years later, he came out with another one, Diary of the Dead. I did not expect this. But hey, another one from the master? I'll take it. George Romero has always been one of my idols, but there comes a time when you realize not everything your idol does is gold. Diary of the Dead, once again, has no direct connection with any of the other Dead films, but this one seems to step back in time when the zombie epidemic is in its early phase. We aren't so deep yet into the zombie apocalypse, people are just becoming aware of what's happening. But the original movie took place in the 60s, this one is set in the present day YouTube generation, so I guess you could say this one's a reboot. The style that sets it apart from the other dead movies is that it's one of those found footage films like Blair Witch Project and Cloverfield. It centers around a low budget filmmaker, Jason, who's trying to make a horror movie, but then the real life zombies start attacking. So instead he begins filming the zombie crisis every step of the way with the help of his girlfriend, Deborah. After Jason is killed, she edits all the footage together and releases it as a documentary called The Death of Death. I like the idea of this found footage style, but here it's done completely wrong. The whole idea of that style is to make it seem convincing that what you're watching is real. The quality of the footage is way too good for us to believe it was spontaneously shot. Everybody is always in focus and always well lit. 
I mean, the lighting is dark, but not in an unintentional way, in a staged, moody, and cinematic way, just like any real horror film. Even more baffling is the composition. Everything that happens, they manage to capture it. Not once does the camera ever miss anything. Shoot in the head! Even when they put the camera down, everybody is always inside the frame. Every shot looks planned. They also use two cameras so they can cut between two angles. It's as if Romero couldn't decide to make a found footage movie or a regular cinematic film. Not to mention, these people are holding the cameras like robots. They don't even look like they care what's going on. Why are they not running? Also, the idea of cutting between multiple cameras ruins the subjective nature of a POV. There's no long takes to make us feel like we're really there. Not to mention one tiny detail, the two cameras are completely different. One of them is some kind of pro camera, the other is clearly a DVX-100, which isn't even a high-def camera. Deborah calls it an HVX, but it's not. This is a more nitpicky thing. The point is, these two cameras would never match so flawlessly. The audio is the most inexcusable of all. Everybody's voice is 100% clear. Come on, before we get our asses shot off. I'm leaving you, Jason. You can keep the house, I'll take the car. Did they ADR this whole documentary, or did everybody have hidden microphones? Come on. Then there's the music. Why would there be music? Oh, don't worry, Deborah explains it. I've added music occasionally for effect, hoping to scare you. This line is embarrassing. Like, really? You're gonna spell it out like that? This is a horror movie, get ready to be scared. And if you have footage of your friends being killed, how could you be so insensitive to put music in it? Then there's the don't mess with Texas girl. Don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Texas. A minor thing, when one of the cameras is losing battery power, we see the battery icon on the screen. That wouldn't happen unless Deborah added it there to be cute. Most importantly, there's the acting. In these found footage films, that's the hardest part to get right. If the acting is not believable, then everything falls apart. And here, all the acting, all across the board, is awful. That's enough, Deb. I there is not one line of dialogue spoken that doesn't sound fake. Take, for example, this scene where Jason is filming in a girl's dorm and encounters a robber. What's the guy with the video camera doing in the women's dorm? Security! Did the robber forget he's on video? One thing that'll satisfy any zombie fan is the abundance of gore. It's all computer generated, but it still does the trick. One scene that sticks out is when they meet a deaf Amish guy who communicates by writing on a chalkboard. It's an abrupt change of mood. It's a comedy scene played for laughs. I wonder why Deborah didn't add some goofy music. And I'm not here to rip the movie apart. I don't want to talk about every little moment that bugged me, but I can't let this go. They're sitting around listening to a news broadcast, and right when it ends, they turn off the TV. I hate that. I hate that cliche. I understand why they do it. They have the TV running here, and they don't want the sound of the TV running over the rest of the scene, so they shut it off just for convenience. But it's one thing to do it in a real cinematic movie, but to do it in a found footage film, that's just dumb. Romero always has an agenda. Every movie he makes has some kind of message. One thing he seems to be getting at here is how people are becoming desensitized to the tragedies of the world. I can see how some people vicariously watch the tragedies on the news safe from their living rooms, but I don't understand how this applies to the filmmakers who are actually there in danger themselves. Another thing the movie seems to be trying to say is that the news on TV hides the truth. I would assume the message here is that the common people who record things and upload them to the internet are a more truthful source of information, but then the movie goes on to say that there's an oversaturation of information because everybody with a camera is uploading stuff. Scattered over the entire film is Deborah's annoying narration beating these messages into your head. What gets into our heads when we see something horrible? So what is the message? What is the movie really trying to say? 
It's the first Romero film where the politics and the messages get in the way of it being an entertaining movie. I respect that Romero went back to his indie roots. Diary of the Dead was much lower budget than Land of the Dead, and Romero said that he had a lot more control over it. I'm glad that he's still making movies in the 21st century, but this is one that I tend to forget about. It tried to do something different in an age that's oversaturated with zombie films, but it was misguided and didn't hit the right notes for me. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Of all the dead films, Survival of the Dead is the hardest for me to review because I never expected this movie to exist. George Romero used to make these movies once every 10 years, and now in his old age, he cranked out three of them in rapid succession. Of all the dead films, this is the one that best fits the description of a sequel. It seems to follow the events of Diary of the Dead, and it has a main recurring character. The two things that I didn't like about Diary of the Dead are fixed this time. One is the found footage style, which I thought had potential but was misguided. This time we're back to a regular narrative style. And the other thing is the in-your-face social commentary. This time it's downplayed under the surface, like it should be. It centers around people from the military who are trying to escape the zombie crisis by boat and arrive at an island where people are in disagreement over how to handle the zombies. On one side, there's people who want to kill them all. On the other side, you have people who want to keep the zombies around, keeping them chained up or behind fences, in hopes that one day a cure will be discovered. I think that's an interesting idea, but it doesn't come to any interesting resolution, and it seems sort of like a recycling of some of the ideas in Day of the Dead and other zombie films, but you, you really can't blame it because there's been so many zombie movies that pretty much everything's been done already. Now for some casual observations. There's a lot of wide open scenery. It's a pleasant film to look at and makes me think of autumn weather. There's also a lot of western movie elements here. There's a lot of dark humor as well. It's kind of similar in tone to Shaun of the Dead, which Romero was a big fan of. Well, there's nothing in here as brilliant as Shaun of the Dead, but it's still pretty amusing. There's some great zombie kills. It's heavy on CG, but there is one moment that uses practical effects where the zombies are ripping people apart. It's nothing original, but it's nice to see a little bit of that classic Romero gore. There's zombie heads on spikes, which is a pretty sick idea. This is the creepiest and most noteworthy image in the film. Setting fire to a zombie's head has to be the most awkward effect. It just looks weird. Overall, Survival of the Dead? It's okay. I don't have any peeves with it like I did with Diary of the Dead, and nothing really sticks out as being groundbreaking either. It's just okay. I think the big problem was that there were so many zombie movies that I was completely numb to the genre. This one just blends in with the rest. If it hadn't been for the name George Romero, I wouldn't have been watching it. But let's not end the Halloween season on such a dull note. Tomorrow, we're going to look at the masterpiece that started it all, Night of the Living Dead. This is one of those instances where I say, the movie's so good, I can't do it justice. Just watch it. And that's what we're going to do. So, tune in tomorrow for Halloween. It's going to be Night of the Living Dead, full-length commentary.